In chapter 11, we're going to be explaining how inheritance works, and we're going to be focusing primarily on the work of Gregor Mendel. So we often describe what Mendel figured out as his insights. Uh, some people call them Mendel's observations, or usually they're currently referred to as Mendel's laws, and we'll get to those in a little bit. But the basic idea behind all this is kind of a history lesson. We don't do a whole lot of history in this course, but this is a case where we find it appropriate. So we're going to back up to the mid-1800s, and about 150 years ago was when Darwin had proposed his ideas for natural selection. And one of the keys to natural selection is the fact that in a species there has to be variation. If there's no variation, there's no ability for a species to change through evolution. So scientists had this concept of a variation out there, but the ironic thing was, back 150 years ago, what was being taught in schools was that the way traits were inherited was through a blending of traits. So if you have a tall father and a short mother, you're going to be kind of medium height. And they would teach that as if it were a true statement. The kind of unusual thing about that is if blending is an explanation for how inheritance takes place, that would not lead to an increase in variation. You can picture it pretty quickly. There, there'd be no way to get really tall people or really short people. There'd be no way to get people that were very intelligent or, or very unintelligent. Everyone would be kind of just average. So if blending were the only method of inheritance, we would all be pretty similar to each other. Within every species, everyone would be about the same, and there'd be no evolution. Now, not only is it a case where we we realize that this doesn't make sense in terms of variation, but observations simply show us that this isn't true. It's one of these weird cases where scientists were teaching something that they could very easily just go outside and observe the world and find out wasn't true. So if you ask any farmer, if you breed a black horse and a white horse, what are the offspring going to be? Well, they aren't always going to be gray. Now, it's possible you can get something that is a blend of the two, but it's not always the case. You could get a spotted horse, you could get a black horse, you could get a white horse. In really unusual cases, you may get a red horse. So that leads us to our main subject of this chapter, Gregor Mendel, who lived in the 1800s in an area that at the time was Austria. Um, it's now part of the Czech Republic. And Gregor Mendel was very good at making observations, very good at planning experiments, had a, a pretty good knowledge of statistics and mathematics, and he came up with a new hypothesis to explain how uh, inheritance was taking place. And as I said earlier, his ideas are now referred to as laws. Now, just as a reminder, a law is not just a really, really good hypothesis. A law is a description without explanation necessarily there as a part of it. So we're going to talk about some of Mendel's laws he didn't have explanations for them. Some of them we do have explanations for today. But the way Mendel came about coming up with his descriptions and his insights was through experimentation. And Mendel's most famous experiments took place with pea plants. Later on in his life, he also experimented with honeybees. Kind of a funny story. Mendel was a monk, and actually he originally wanted to study mice to try to figure out how inheritance took place. But his bishop felt it was inappropriate for a religious person to be studying animal sex, which would be required if you were going to study how mice were having their inheritance take place. So that was why he switched to, to garden plants. And he had raised pea plants from the time he was a young man, even before he went into becoming a monk. Now, it is important that he picked pea plants because one trait with pea plants, if you look at the flowers here, Notice what you can't see inside is the area where the pollen is produced. And if you remember, pollen is actually the, the place in the plant where the male gamete, the sperm, is located. And since we can't see the pollen, we know it's actually buried deep inside the folds of these kind of, kind of unusual flower petals they have. The pollen never comes outside. And also inside those folds where the egg is located, and those eggs get fertilized by the pollen without it ever leaving the flower, so what that means biologically is that the pea plants are always fertilizing themselves. 
this is sexual reproduction because it involves sperm and eggs, but it's sexual reproduction with the same parent acting as both mother and father. Now, what that meant in terms of inheritance was that all the pea plants in Mendel's garden when he started his experiments were all pure breeding. We use that term purebred when we talk about things like dogs and cats and, and other animals. If you have a purebred Cocker Spaniel, that means its parents were Cocker Spaniels, and if you breed that Cocker Spaniel with other purebred Cocker Spaniels, you can predict what the offspring are going to look like. Everyone can picture in their mind what a Cocker Spaniel appears as. Well, if Mendel was going to look at the pea plants he had in his garden, he looked at what they currently would look like, and he knew the offspring would look very similar because they were pure breeding. As he kept looking at his pea plants, he discovered that not all the pea plants were the same, though. Even though the parents resembled the offspring in each generation, he discovered there were some variations in there, and he focused on seven key traits, and each one of those seven traits came in two distinct forms. I have a table here showing the seven traits he studied. These aren't the only traits in pea plants, but we do know these are the traits that Mendel studied. You know, the color of the flower, whether they had purple or white flowers, um, whether the, the peas themselves were yellow or green, and so on. The one example we follow the most often, it's just kind of the textbook example, is the height of the pea plants. And they're either called tall and dwarf, or more commonly called tall or short. And so that's the example we'll be using most frequently as we go through discussing how this inheritance takes place. But Mendel realized that even though the plants in nature were always self-pollinating, he could force them to cross-pollinate. Um, it's pretty easy to do with plants. You just simply open up the flower to find where the pollen is. And if you act before the pollen is fully matured and ready to use, you can remove pollen from one flower so it won't pollinate itself. You can then take pollen from another flower using something like a paintbrush and paint it into another flower and just and allow the pollen the opportunity to, to pollinate that flower. Well, in doing so, he could take two pure breeding plants that were different from each other, like a, a purebred tall plant and a purebred short plant, and force them to cross with each other, wait for a couple months until the peas are produced in the, the new pea pods, wait till the next year, keeping careful record of you know which peas came from which plants, wait the next year, plant those peas, wait for a couple months, and watch the growth. You know, these are experiments that would take a year for one generation study. If you want to do multiple generations, you're talking multiple years. Um, Mendel, being a monk, maybe had a little more free time than some other people did. He gave him time to do an experiment like this. Today, most genetics experiments tend to be done on species that reproduce more quickly. We often use things like fruit flies to get you know, a generation in just two or three weeks time as opposed to waiting an entire year. Well, in doing his experiments with the pea plants, one thing he could definitely prove was that blending was not the way that inheritance normally took place. When he bred tall plants with short plants, he did not get medium height plants. What he ended up doing as he worked through lots of these experiments was he discovered what we still realize today is the most common method of inheritance in any species that reproduces sexually. And his ideas were really amazing, fantastic discoveries. And he realized this, and so he wrote up an article, submitted it to a journal. Uh, the journal's title, if you translate it to English, comes across as something like hybridization in pea plants. And maybe it was kind of an unfortunate title because Pretty much the entire scientific world ignored the, the article completely. The only other journal articles that reference having looked at this seemed to be people that thought it was just an article just about how you make hybrid plants, which any gardener in, in Mendel's time period already knew how to do, so this wouldn't be very exciting news. You know, if he'd titled it something along the lines of, I've discovered how inheritance takes place, maybe more people would have noticed. Uh, Mendel's work was in the mid-1800s by around 1865 or so, I believe, he had kind of moved on and was no longer doing any real experimentation at that point with inheritance. He kind of got more involved in his role in the church. In the 1880s, he passed away. At that time period, no one really had recognized at all what his work was. In the year 1900, three different scientists working in three different countries 
each were setting inheritance and before they could publish their work, they had to prove that no one else had discovered the same things already. They each stumbled across Mendel's journal um, articles that he'd written and realized that they'd been kind of trumped by a, a monk who had already died 20 years previously. All three of those scientists gave Mendel credit for the work that he had done because in science, you know, being the first gives you the, the right to claim the ownership of the idea. And so to this day now, we consider Mendel to be kind of the father of genetic studies. He's often referred to as the father of heredity or father of genetics. Well, in order to discuss the ideas we're going to in the next couple of parts of this chapter, we need to have some vocabulary that we can share to talk through the ideas. And we're going to use, in all cases, the modern terms. Some of these terms Mendel used, most of them he would not have. But it's just going to help us to make sense if we use the modern terminology all the way through so we don't have to switch part way through. So we're going to talk about genes. And we've mentioned genes before back in chapters 9 and 10. A gene is just simply genetic information for producing a trait. It's specifically one gene is how to make one specific polypeptide, or if you want to think of it as one gene is how to make one single protein. Well, genes are found on chromosomes, and chromosomes have more than one gene on them. So the location of a gene on a chromosome is called the locus. The, the plural is loci, or some people pronounce it loci. Um, the gene's locus ends up sometimes being important in terms of how inheritance takes place. We'll get to that more later on. And when we talked about homologous chromosomes back in chapter 10 especially, we said that they contained genes for the same traits. Well, those genes were always found at the same locus on each chromosome. So if we know for humans, for one particular chromosome, what genes are found on that and where, that's going to be true for all humans, assuming they don't have mutations in those, in those chromosomes. Now, we talked about diploid cells before. If a cell is diploid, that means it has pairs of chromosomes. Well, that means it also has pairs of genes. So every diploid cell has a gene pair for every trait. Every genetic trait that you have, you have two genes for it. One gene came from your father, one gene came from your mother. Now, those genes don't all necessarily have to be the same. If your dad gave you a different set of information for the same trait than your mom did, we'd call those different forms of a gene alleles. So, for instance, back to Mendel's pea plants, there is a gene for height of a pea plant. That gene comes in two different forms. It comes in a tall form and a short form. So there's a tall allele and a short allele. Now, a word you may remember from middle school, homozygous. If you are homozygous for a trait, you may be called a homozygote for that trait. And what that means is that your two alleles for that trait are exactly the same. So in this particular diagram, we might represent that with two capital R's. We may represent them as two lowercase r's. And we're simply saying if you are homozygous that your alleles match each other for that one single trait. As opposed to being heterozygous, if you're heterozygous, you have two different alleles, and we usually represent those with one capital and one lowercase letter is in the picture here. Now, if you're heterozygous, what Mendel discovered, among many other things, is that one of your two alleles is going to be dominant and the other allele is going to be recessive. That dominant allele is the only one that will show up. Now, if you're homozygous, it doesn't matter whether that particular allele is dominant or recessive for you. If you're homozygous, you're going to show or express that allele that you have. But if you're heterozygous, even though you have two different alleles, you're normally only going to only going to express one of those. A couple other terms we often use. We use the term phenotype. If we want to describe what traits you have, what observable traits you have, these are some pictures of some peas here. The two pictures on the left would either be called round or smooth peas, and the pea on the right would be a wrinkled pea. And that just simply describes their phenotype, and that's something that's very easy to observe. Whereas genotype, is when we list the actual alleles that you have. So underneath each P, their genotype is being shown. And the reason the two P's on the left and center are both smooth is they have the dominant allele. The one on the left is homozygous for the dominant allele, so it has two dominant alleles. It's going to show that smooth form. The one in the middle is being heterozygous. 
and because smooth is dominant, that's the only one it shows, the P isn't like half smooth and half wrinkled. The P on the right's genotype, little s, little s, indicates that it has two recessive alleles. In this case, they're alleles for being wrinkly. And within one single gene, the common way to do it is to use the same letter in both dominant and recessive form using the capital and lowercase letter for that form. Now I've got to admit, I think the choice of the letter S is kind of a poor choice in this diagram because capital S and lowercase s look about the same. Um, so some letters you usually want to avoid using would be not just S, but things like O and X. Um, if you do use letters that look similar to this, often for the lowercase one, we often will make it cursive also. So I don't know if you were taught cursive handwriting, if they still teach that at all in school, but if you know your cursive letters, that's another way to show the recessive form, but still shown in a lowercase cursive form. Now that we have our vocabulary, we'll be able to go into the second part of this chapter and get into what Mendel's discoveries were. Uh, this first part, just basically get a background, but should lead us into the real work that Mendel discovered. So have a good day, and as always, bring your questions to class if you have any.